Hello again, NBA fans, and welcome to another NBA Roundtable. My name is Matt Eppers. I'm a digital producer at USA Today Sports, and we are here to talk playoffs. The first round is underway, and to break down some of the key storylines from the first few days, I'm joined, as always, by Jeff Zilgit and Mark Medina of USA Today Sports. We'll break down just how far Damian Lillard's knees can carry the Blazers, how commanding the Bucks series lead really is, and how much swagger the Grizzlies have as an eight seed. Have, have the Nuggets sort of figured out a key to containing Lillard? Well, I think for one game, and Aaron Gordon, I, I love his moxie telling the coaching staff at halftime, hey, I got him after he had 32 points in the first half. And I think that this validates the Nuggets' internal thought that when they got Aaron Gordon uh, as part of a trade deadline deal, that this put them in the contention mix. Now, things have obviously changed with Jamal Murray's uh, absence, but this is one of the reasons why they felt like this was a game-changing move. Now, that being said, Damian Lillard's going to make adjustments. Uh, I think, you know, there is this simplistic narrative that he is carrying the team. They do have some offensive depth, but I think that the challenge is where they're at defensively. So I trust that Damian will still be able to be a threat, but I think that uh, this game two incident really reflects the Nuggets ability to make adjustments and rely on their offensive and defensive versatility. Yeah, I wasn't the first one who said this uh, when the deal happened, and I'll just get into this one real quick on Aaron Gordon, is that the Nuggets were going to get more out of Aaron Gordon on the defensive end than they probably were on the offensive end. Not that he can't contribute offensively, but you know, again, aside from Jamal Murray not being with the team, the, the hierarchy is Nikola Jokic, Michael Porter Jr. And and then, you know, it's a combination of players who are gonna chip in. And but on the defensive end is where Aaron Gordon can really make his mark. But I really agree with Mark in that you're you're not gonna contain Damian Lillard every game like that. Obviously in that huge first quarter or first half. But this is the kind of defense the Nuggets are going to need uh, without Jamal Murray to beat this Portland team. Let's let's shift to the uh, the Eastern Conference real quick in a series that's also through two games. Uh, the Bucks are up two nothing after routing the Heat in Game Two. Through two games, Jeff, how how different have the Bucks looked from previous years? Well, I think the one thing you see from this Bucks team, and they've learned their lesson, is that they've sort of been this slow train building to get up to this high speed playoffs. And so they didn't spend too much energy trying to get to, you know, X number of wins like they had in the past, you know, getting 60 wins in the 82 game season. Mike Boonholzer deserves some credit for maybe pacing this team a little bit better. They also have, and we've mentioned this a couple of times on the round table, the versatility defensively uh, to switch a little bit more. Drew Holiday can guard a variety of positions. Chris Middleton can. Giannis Andetokounmpo obviously can. And so you start to throw those factors in, and the Bucks and Boonholzer have always had good defensive teams. Uh, but I don't want to sell Milwaukee short uh, on this one. I think they've learned some lessons. That doesn't mean they're going to get to a championship or win a championship. But I think some lessons have been learned over the past couple of years and how they've exited the playoffs to be a little bit better prepared for the long haul uh, of the series uh, than they were previously. The Grizzlies' confidence is sky high right now. Uh, we see him chirping on the floor. We see Dylan Brooks with the sunglasses in the post-game Zoom sessions. You know, guys, this, this team is not carrying itself like, like a typical eight seed. Yeah, without a doubt. And I mean, look, things will, will likely get tougher because the Jazz are ranked number one for a reason in the West and Donovan Mitchell's expected to be back for game two after he was uh, held out at game one because, you know, the Jazz wanted to be careful with his ankle injury. So, you know, by default, the Jazz are going to be a better team with, with Mitchell on the floor. And, you know, I trust that Rudy Gobert will avoid fouling out. But I think that there is a lot of uh, upside for Memphis with facing those pressure packed elimination games against San Antonio, against Golden State. Dylan Brooks has done a marvelous job with defending guys like DeMar DeRozan and Steph Curry and making them work for their shots. And even though they still had really good games, just the idea of making it harder for them to put pressure on their other teammates to, to make things easier. So I like where the Grizzlies are headed, but I think at the end of the day, 
uh, the Jazz will ultimately prevail in, in both Game 2 and beyond. Mark, Mark mentioned that Donovan Mitchell is going to be back for Game 2 of this series after he was he was a late scratch in Game 1, and we've since learned that he was he was pretty upset uh, about that. Um, how do we see this sort of situation having any sort of uh, uh, effect on, on on the Jazz in this next game? Um, they they seem like they've got a pretty uh, you know a pretty professional bunch that isn't gonna isn't gonna let something like this uh, uh, impact them too much. But at the same time, you you, you never know because there were some you know some comments after that game from from Mitchell and some of his teammates that sort of you know cast cast some uh some doubt on exactly what went down with the training staff yeah i mean things are always fluid in the nba so you never want to discount anything but i would suspect that some of the frustration will become assuaged by virtue of the fact that donovan will be playing in game two i think that he'll be playing really well and it's understandable why he felt frustrated i mean he's been out of the lineup since april 16th and there was some hope that he would return before the end of the regular season so he could build some momentum and rhythm heading into the playoffs and then even as of the day of game one the thought was after shoot around he would be back but uh then the the jazz reconsidered because they wanted to protect him from himself and determine that he still needed some healing so i trust that they'll be fine moving forward as far as just any lingering frustration stemmed from donovan's absence yeah, and I'll just add uh, a, a couple of the tag on to what Mark just said, is that this organization has, has a lot of Spurs influence. Dennis Lindsay, who runs basketball operations, used to work in San Antonio. Quinn Snyder did as well. He coached their G League team. And so they have that sort of Spurs-esque um, philosophy in managing things. And then they take it a step further. Obviously, there's a new ownership group there in Utah with Ryan Smith. Tech billionaire comes in, uh, Utah native, buys the team. But he also brings Dwayne Wade in as a, uh, you know, has a partial ownership in the team now. And don't discount Dwayne Wade's influence on this team, and especially Donovan Mitchell. Um, those two, you know, look, Donovan's game gets compared to Dwayne Wade's a lot. And I... You know, if Donovan hadn't signed that extension, the Miami Heat were probably going to be interested at some point of trying to lure Donovan away from Utah uh, to bring in Dwayne Wade 2.0. And so when you have a former player who understands player dynamics, um, I think it can certainly help even smooth out the edges around that situation even more. The Jazz win game two if they do. All that's forgotten. They're looking forward, looking to try to close out the series and on to the next round. Well, that, my friends, is going to wrap another NBA roundtable. Uh, many thanks to Mark Medina and Jeff Dilgett for joining me again today. My name is Matt Eppers. We hope you'll join us again next time. Until then, thank you so much for watching on USA Today Sports. Just doing my best, Dylan Brooks. <laughs>